Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road. And that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. It's over the bar. Today's RTE GA podcast is looking forward to summer hurling in October. Hello and welcome along to the RTE GA podcast. I'm delighted to say today I am joined by Rory O'Neill, Michael Dygan and Anthony Daly. And we are talking about the half forward line on the all-star hurling team of the Sunday game era. How are we all doing, lads? Good, good Mikey. Mike. Very good. How's it going? Good. good. All right. Um, quickly, our thoughts on um, what came out yesterday. Michael, you obviously... Uh, there's only so much you can say, but you can talk to us as a hurling man. What's our uh, what's our feelings on um, the the plan as laid out by the GA that we we won't see any championship hurling before uh, before October? Yeah, look, it's um, I think John Horn had said it had said it last week the week before that that was more than likely. I think once once they extended the training lockdown until the 20th of July, if you think about it, you only have August then in September. So if you're going to have a club window, and you know, I, I think uh, some people are, are thinking out there this morning that it's kind of putting the club player at risk or whatever before the county player. That's not the, the reason. The reason, the sequence in is because to get the club back, obviously, all our players are club players. Um, but that's only if it's safe to do so. And, uh, you know, I think we all recognise that we're going to have to get back out there as a society, get back to work. I don't think we'll be doing, hopefully we won't be doing Zoom calls in the middle of the in the middle of the morning or early afternoon uh, in the next few weeks that we can get back out and have some sort of normal life. So that's why we'll have to wait and see how society reacts over the next few weeks. But I don't think it was fair to put pressure on the GA to open up and to try to police fours very early in May when we don't know anything much about this virus. We've, mm. been, we've been locked down for seven or eight weeks now and yet we have people still dying every day. That's the reality. And we're not meeting each other. And we had 37 people or something died yesterday. We have still have hundreds of people uh, picking up the virus. So I think it would be insane to think we can start gathering until we know more about it, start gathering in groups. Yeah. And I suppose the, the, the advantage that the GA have here is they can probably see how, see how the, the loosening of the regulations go and competitive sporting action return goes in soccer and rugby. And they can probably learn a lot from that. If, if the League of Ireland can work, then maybe the GA can, can, can manage a championship. Yeah, and that, that's it, Mike. And it's all over Europe as well. I mean, you know, you even look at the Bundesliga uh, ready to reopen. And I, I think we're going to very much have to wait and see. And maybe that's a little advantage we have that how others get on. And if you see big increases uh, or a, a resurge, as they say, then I think everything is up for review. But I think the GA were right maybe to hook it down the road a little bit for the time being because I think people would love you know, the amount of older people that I talked to um, as part of the whole, I suppose, people that are cocooned, you know, that we, we give a chat to, even talking to one lad yesterday, said, Gene, wouldn't it be grand to have an All-Ireland final the first week in December? He wouldn't mind, you know. Yeah. No, I do. I do. He, he would be of equal that he'd love to see the county final. Do you know, he's not, he's not county over club by any means. But uh, I think with Croker and with Cork, we have a huge uh, advantage now in that they're both nearly all weather surfaces, uh, you know, and the weather doesn't affect them as much. Um, Look, at, I, we could be very lucky with the winter. It could be mild, and sometimes you can have a terrible, as we've seen in later years, uh, February and March when the national leagues are on. So it's just there's so many unknowns, I think. But I'd still kind of cling to the hope that we will have a 2020 uh, club and county um, championships played. Yeah, and Rory, from your perspective, from a TV perspective, the idea of running off two championships, even if it's knockout in the space of eight or 12 weeks, you could be looking at a, a pretty hectic pretty hectic, hectic from a TV production point of view. Beautiful problem to have, though. You know, um, if that were to happen, <clears throat> it'd be fantastic. I think um, it would be, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's like, it'd be like yeah, having all your Christmases come at once in one sense and like you just game after game after game every week. I think it would be fantastic if that were, if that were to happen. But like the lads said, I think there's probably a bit of an error on the side of caution from the GA's point of view. They were possibly throwing a little bit of a hospital pass last Friday night by the Taoiseach uh, without, you, you know, trying to get people's hopes up too much. I think hope is a good thing. It's not a strategy and it is a good thing. But false hope is not a good thing. And um, I think what the GAA did yesterday was introduce an element of realism into the debate. And I think that was probably a wise move on their part. Yeah. 
all right, sure. Let's get to the escapism here, lads. And we'll, 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 yeah, let's do that. We'll come back to coronavirus <laughs> another day. You know? yeah. Anyway, yeah. our midfield yeah. has been yeah. chosen I, on this I thought, team. I, I, Go on. I thought Dela was turned into Ebizek there for a minute with the, with the weather. But I was just saying there, I thought that Dela was turned into Evelyn Cusack for a second with the weather predictions for, for <laughs> later on the year. But. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, very good. Well, the beast from the east was around April, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, um, so we have a midfield now. I've, 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 I've lost it one second. I'm going to get up my screen here. Uh, bear with me, callers. Anyway, we have, as I say, we have our, um, we have a hurling midfield selected now. It's um, Michael Fenley and uh, Tommy Dunn. And I don't think that he too 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 many arguments brooked there. No, Although if you do really. have an argument, please please give it to me now. I, I look forward to hearing it. Yeah, well, the only thing with that, Mike, I, I I probably Tommy was one of the most difficult players I ever marked, and that was at at right half forward. So I suppose it's just he did play a lot of his best hurling in midfield as well, um, with a couple of others. He tried to pick a a monster. Um, Kind of a railway cup team, and and we we actually nominated him in the half forward line. So, yeah, that's just one. I suppose Mick Finley, yeah, outstanding. I suppose he really was a tour de force of the Kilkenny, you know, dominance of the last uh, decade and a bit. Yeah, uh, Michael, uh, yourself, how would you feel about that? Uh, those well, back to there. I was a bit nervous about coming on today because the last day I was on, we were talking about the half back line, and then it, or no, it was the full back line actually. Full back line, Jackie. Yeah. Yeah, with Jackie. And then you came along and this half-back line left out JJ. So I had a theory about this team during the week now. I'm going to share it with you. Um, I think what you should have done was pick the best Kilkenny team of the Sunday game era and see, could anyone else get into it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. Because what you'd have, you'd have Owen Murphy in goals. You'd have maybe Paul Murphy or Michael Cavan at cornerback. Noel Hickey fullback. And uh, Jackie, Jackie left cornerback. They'd have Tommy Walsh, maybe Jared Henderson and JJ Delaney. And the best luck to anyone trying to get into that line and yeah. any of those positions. But uh, look, it's, it's, it's good. The JJ mission, obviously, it's a public vote. Like, I loved some of the conspiracy theories that were going around uh, about us all. Dale, you got Brian Lohan onto it. Um, I got Brian Lohan. We didn't want any of the Sky lad. You got Lohan on, yeah. We didn't want any of the Sky lads. And Cummins got in the goals because he's on the Sunday game. And, uh, <laughs> all, these lads, all these lads were fairly good hurlers as well. I yeah. think remind you. But um, the midfield. But it's like everything. We're going to start here in a half hour. You could pick. 50 teams like being honest yeah, about it yeah, like, yeah. It's, when it's a public vote that's great but sure you know you, you talk about Colin Lynch and Ollie Baker in the middle of the field you talk about Johnny Pilkington who played with me Kieran Carey Mike Hoolahan with Limerick in the 90s I'm only talking about lads I played against Ma- Ma- Michael Coleman from Galway you know a savage yeah. of a man so all, all of those lads would easily hold their own against Michael Fenley and Tommy Dunn or be better than them on a given day yeah. and you know and, and I think there's probably a number of automatics on any team of the last 40-50 years JJ Laney won them and he didn't make it. So, you know, it's, it's, all, it's, 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 it's automatics and then there's automatic automatics. It's all, it's all, it's all, it's all, it's all perceptions and who, and who, 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 who does, who, who, it's a bit like I'm watching a thing on, on Netflix at the moment about, uh, 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 nar- about drugs in, in Mexico, like it's paying for votes, you know. So, I wonder is there, is there some sort of a so it's some sort of a narcos situation going on here with lads. <laughs> yeah. in. Well, it had even it had, like in Clare, they'd done this kind of thing with, with uh, through one of the newspapers, I and uh, that, yeah, 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 like the hurling one, relatively you know, not just because I got on, <laughs> but the, there was no great. But when the football one started, because there was kind of three weeks notice, you had clubs appealing on their Facebook pages <laughs> for get get the vote out for Johnny or Billy or you know. So I wonder is I, there a bit of that? Is there a bit of that going on in this? I think something like that might have happened as well a few years ago when RT went down the road of um, trying to pick its greatest GA moment of all time. And I think the winner was Michael Donlan's point against Kildare in the 98 final. And I don't know whether it was a sort of a campaign, but like, it, it, it just, like obviously the greatest moment in GA history. I mean, I'm sure, I don't know whether Michael might agree. But the greatest moment in GA history is Seamus Darby. I would suggest, w- would that be fair? Yeah, um, I, w- I watched the game again the other day on whatever day it was on RT, and uh, like it's amazing. I know we're maybe getting old and soft, and we're locked down. But I nearly cry- I got a tear in my eye again when yeah, he's, yeah. like you think it was the first time I saw it, yeah. and uh, 
um, you know, just a commentary for me. Like, it's all the memories. And the old dressing room clip afterwards, like, yeah, again, which, fantastic. With, 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 with Mick Dunn and the lads with the pints of milk and, and Father Heaney, who was the chairman, who was a great Smoking chairman, brother, brother Sylvester, God rest Brother Sylvester. But, like, the, the, to see the two, the two words, there was someone sort of said, is this where Father Ted came from? And all these <laughs> comments were made. But, yeah. but look, yeah. Martin Furlow, what about the penalty save? And Martin's answer, what about it? Like, yeah. as I said, <laughs> <laughs> no, in the off the accent, what, what about me? It, it was an awfully style answer, Michael, uh, yeah, for sure. And you lucky you don't have to be a man of the cloth to be county chairman now, Michael, anyway. Well, yeah. geez, that's for sure, yeah. <laughs> do you, do you know the other, thing, the other thing with that was, Michael, like, when, watching it again, and do you know your memories are furlong save, I suppose, the goal, maybe a bit of controversy about a couple of late frees, but then to watch the quality of the game again, it was a really good game of football, wasn't it? That's the one yeah. thing that struck me, yeah. sitting down I, to watch I, it all. Yeah, I think what we've seen over the last six or seven weeks watching the old matches, some of them stand up to test the time, some of them don't. You know, we all acknowledge some of them that. Don't. Yeah. yeah, we all acknowledge players are fitter and are better prepared and all that. But that actual 82 game, because Offaly had prepared for, like Kerry would be right, widely, I suppose the Dublin team now and that Kerry team, the two greatest teams of all time. But Offaly had spent five or six years trying to get to that standard. They'd been in, they'd won Leinster's, they'd been in all in semi final in 81, or final in 81, semi final in 80. Let the one Leinster in '79, like they had worked so hard at that level, and, and in Matt like Connor, and in Matt Connor, they had a genius as well, I suppose, Michael, didn't they? Really, and that does help when you have that bit, sprinkle of stardust in they your do, team. But, but but things happen in Ireland final, and that and Delo knows this. Um, Mark, Eugene McGee, who, who was a year dead, it was a gesture the day before Eugene, mm, yeah. and got a lovely man. And uh, but Eugene told Liam Corms in the dressing room that day, whatever he did, don't kick the ball. Because Liam was an athlete, he was a great hurler. Get the ball, solo, hand, lay it off, move, support. First ball he gets, up the wing, 50 yards out, outside the right boot, straight over the bar. You know, and, and the three Offaly, the three Offaly halfbacks scored a point from play each in the first half. Pat Fitzgerald, Sean Lowry and Liam Corms. Brendan Lowry, Shane's dad, got three points from play in the first half. Matt wasn't, these players had raised again. Johnny Mooney got a couple of great points. Matt actually... You know, and, and he was a genius and he got an unbelievable point to Little Shimmy. But it, was, it showed how strong Offaly had got. Matt, it's a bit like Jordan at the moment. I'm watching the last dance. He made the players around him better and realised that he had to be the team player for the team to get over the line. And Matt Connor did the same. He raised that standard of all those players around him. And that was the day then that we saw it. I think, you know, yeah. epitomizing yeah. itself best. Are we, are we recording the football podcast today or tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, well, we're just talking about vote rigging, so let's get back to some more vote rigging. So, for those, for those listening and not watching, the Hurling All-Stars and Sunday Game Era team, as it stands, no, as it stands, as voted for by the readers of RT.ie, is Brendan Combs and Goal, Brian Corcoran, Brian Lone, Dermot O'Sullivan in the full back line, Tommy Walsh, Barry Maher and Brian Whelan in the much-discussed half-back line, and now we have Tommy Dunn and Michael Fenley in midfield. So, listen, before we go any further, we have one member of that team, Tommy Walsh, who uh, wishes to address the, um, the uh, J.J. Delaney uh, omission. And um, he has some, shall we say, he has some harsh words for anybody who didn't vote for his teammate. Uh, so I'm just going to take out my headphones here and we'll play this. He's speaking, uh, he's promoting the Pieta's, Pieta's Darkness and Delight campaign and he's speaking to our colleague, Michael Delaney. Ah, uh, sir, listen, thank you. It wasn't, you know, it's a poem, it's picked by, like, if, you, if you're in a parish, if you're in a, say if you were in Kilkenny, for example, you're picking all oh, the best, the best Kilkenny team of all time. And I'm from Tullerone, I'm going to pick Tullerone that's on that. So right. it's very difficult to get that right when, you know, you have different size populations with that. But the way I looked at that team was, two lads had to be on, because you see, you have brilliant players, and everyone that's on that team deserves to be on it, you know. Um, I would never, you know, disagree with that. But what I would say is the certain lads have to be on it because they're above the Nord 11. They're, I would call them geniuses. And no, 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 no. There's two geniuses like me that I have seen in my lifetime in defence, in defense, and that's Brian Wheel and, and JJ Delaney. So if there's any team ever picked, if the two of them are not on it, the two of them, without a shadow of a doubt, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to take that kind of team seriously. So um, no, Delaney is, is, the two of them, they're the greatest defenders I've ever seen. Why? They do the simple things unbelievable. You go back and look at the night before on Ireland, Brian Whe Damien Creepy was after scoring a 2-2 two, two or 2-3. Two, Brian Whelan got one of the greatest hooks in, and nobody even noticed it. 
it's simple because his technique and he was so brilliant. You go forward into, that was 1994, 20 years later, the next genius, JJ Delaney, dives and does the very same thing. So not Delaney wheel in two greatest defenders I've ever seen and uh, had to be on that. There you go. There. No complaints. Delaney. There's some, some strong words from Tommy Walsh and I don't think any of us disagree with him, do we? No. No, absolutely not. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, we'll get on to our half forwards. I'll give you the top 10 as it stands, as again voted for readers of RT.ie, not some shady, bat, smoky back room in Montrose where we're uh, cooking this up. So uh, here's our top 10. Uh, at 10, we have Ken McGrath. At 9, we have Tony Kelly. At 8, we have James E. O'Connor. At 7, Ben O'Connor. At 6, Joe Cooney. At five, Nicky English. At four, TJ Reid. At three, and on the team, as it stands, DJ Carey. Two, Joe Canning. And number one is Henry Shefflin. And I will just tell you now before we get chatting that there are five men contending for positions here. The rest of Joe Cooney downwards aren't, aren't in contention, no matter how many people vote from here on in. Henry Shefflin's a shoe-in, over 7,000 votes. Joe Canning's a shoe-in, 5,000 votes. There's only... 150 votes separating DJ and TJ, and Nicky English is another 50 votes back. So it's it's pretty tight there for the third position on the team. Um, what would be your? Would you agree with that as it stands, Dalo? Uh well, I I yeah, I'd say it's a fair uh, tally for us. The thing with it, I would probably have DJ and Nicky as inside forwards. But not my preference if I was picking my team uh, to have Nicky, you know, at at corner forward. The top of the right was was you know virtually unmarkable for a period. Um, okay, he he did win awards on the half line, but for me he was an inside man. And I, if he doesn't I make him, it here, he'll be. We're trying as with JJ, we're trying to give everybody as many chances as possible to get on the team. Yeah, and <laughs> equally with DJ, I thought maybe his very best position was at fourteen. No, DJ obviously any of the I'd say from eight to fifteen, DJ would have been. You know, an automatic with most people. I mean, a genius, one of the greatest of all time. The closer he is to go, the fewer steps he has to take. The extra man, I would Yeah, say. yeah, yeah. And I, even against those in the 99 uh, uh, semi-final, you know, we hit it back to a point and looked like we were going to kick for home and just one ball. Brian Lohan maybe just made a wrong call, but there was DJ, 21 yards out, buried it past Davy and, and game over, you know. So... For me, I, I probably would go, if it's down to the five, I would go with the, the Henry, uh, TJ, Joe Canning trio and, and look at the two boys for inside. It would be my preference. Uh, now, an awful lot of names there. I mean, not to be t- going along too far, but I mean, likes of Joe Cooney for me growing up and then getting to play against him now. When I played against him in 95, he was full forward and in 99, he was midfield. So it's weird as well, a bit like Tommy Dunn. A lot of these lads, very flexible. Johnny Dooley, very flexible, could play midfield as well. Uh, for me, Declan Ryan was a, was a savage half forward. I nearly, if you're picking your team, I'd nearly be picking Declan Ryan uh, mm-hmm. to beat teams, you know. Uh, and then two brilliant wing, wing forwards off of him. Lahey, how good was he, Kirby? So, but if it's down to that, that five, I would be nearly putting the two boys uh, in the mix for inside, which I also know will be savage competitive, uh, and and maybe going. I think TJ Reid possibly has to be on the team. Henry and Joe, I think, yeah, they have to be. You know, you're leaving out great men like everywhere. Mark Story, even like you know Ben O'Connor. You look at you, you've named the top ten. You know, saw so Jamesy four All Stars. You know, and he was our go to guy. Mm. Uh, on our team so very very difficult again as, as Michael said you could probably pick another team yeah. to beat, beat a team you know so e- easy question for you Michael since we just had Tommy Walsh talking about the greatest of all time w- would you say Henry Shefflin is the, the greatest hurler of all time Michael um, I, 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 I think he probably at the moment I think TJ Reid has to be staking the claim now um, what, what I'd say about that half forward, and I was joking about, obviously earlier on about Kilkenny, but but if you know, and and Anthony makes the point well about playing in different positions. But like I'd say, if you picked a Galway team, Joe Cooney be centre forward, and Canning would probably be full forward. Like you'd imagine if they were picking the best Galway team. But if you if you took DJ Henry and TJ as a half forward line, like it, it would be 
so they're the three players that people are going to talk about. So if you go to Kilkenny and talk about the greatest player of all time, a lot of the old timers will still say DJ was the best of them all. The criticism of DJ was he had a couple of poorish all Ireland finals. He played actually on that, Michael, on that Michael, on that on that Michael, just just as a point of note, and it's a big thing, and it's well spoken of, I suppose, in Cork more than anywhere else. Like he played in five All Ireland finals against Cork, and he's one point from play. Yeah, and so that speaks for itself, and that is used as a criticism. Um, but he played hundreds and hundreds of brilliant matches, as Dale will tell you. I mean, it, look. Uh, whatever the reason that was in All Ireland finals against Cork, but outside of that, in club games and school games, all his life he was the man. Uh, Shefflin then was just you know everyone speaks about his great, his iron will, his ability, his consistency. Like ten, uh, uh, was he ten All Irelands, eleven All Stars? You know it's unbelievable. And then and TJ then as well. And I'd say the difference between the only way I could sort of look at it is a little bit differently is that Henry played on a way better team over his whole career than maybe, like, I know TJ was on a very strong team but the last couple of years TJ's performance and it's still a very good Kilkenny team but they're not the superstar mm. uh, Galactico team that, that say Henry was on for his whole career now Henry made that team a lot of it as well and DJ would have been the same a lot of DJ's career through the 90s Dela was there with Clare we were there Wexford were there Limerick were there you know Galway, Tip and Cork weren't gone away so, so DJ was in a much more competitive era for Kilkenny hurling and yet he was doing it on on a, on a very regular basis so I think you have to you have to I suppose, add all that into the mix but I think on an overall I suppose on, on what he achieved the way he led the team um, his ability on the big day you'd have to say Shefflin was unbreakable really you know the, in terms of his consistency at a massively high level and then throw in the club as well and then go into management and do what he's done with the club like it's very hard to find any type of a flaw anywhere in what Henry Shefflin has achieved in the game yeah he's uh, now I know he's a he's a colleague of all of us, and he's been on a couple. He's been on one of these podcasts, and we'll probably get him on for the next one, to be honest. And like so, but no, like he's a fascinating character in that you know I, we all know his kind of career path. He wasn't he wasn't the the shining light. He wasn't anointed, you know, when he was a sixteen year old in Kieran's or anything. He was kind of he was kind of a he was a, an unpolished gem that Brian Cody kind of saw something in, and I suppose he kind of had that all his career, didn't he? Um, he uh, he kind of had to prove himself to begin with, and even when he was pretty much lauded as the best hurler of all time, we still have the, the amazing image from his autobiography. To be honest, of him kind of uh, making a home gym with bags of coal because he was so determined to come back. He um, Rory, he really he as, he had the skill, but as you were saying, it's somebody with skill is no good unless they're working awfully hard. And Henry Shefflin worked very hard for his entire career, didn't he? Uh, like it, the two best players I've ever seen play hurling are Brian Wheelahan and Henry Shefflin. Um, no question. And I would probably have Henry just obviously that little bit ahead. Primarily for the display, actually, where he gave in the half forward line. And I've actually never asked him this. I must ask him too. And the lads would remember it well. Michael was obviously co commentator that day too. Was it in the 2012? drawn All-Ireland final when he came out to half forward. He had been inside in the full forward line and they were getting, Galway well, we were on top. And I'd love to know actually, did he make the decision himself to just say, look, do you know what? I need to, I need to, I need to grab a hold of this game. And he went out and he literally, he just, he just, he just ran the show in the second half from a, from a Kilkenny perspective. And I think he ended up hurler of the year as well at the end of it, because it was just, I mean, it, it was like, it was come at the hour, come at the man. And there was, Ah, incredible. I mean, I, I do you remember that, Michael? I do, uh, but it, I thought it was it was intriguing the way Kilkenny used them over the years too. Um, like uh, as, as Anthony started making this point about the flexibility of these lads, but what Kilkenny did with him was they looked at the opposition backline and then they said, "Is there a weakness there?" And they put Shefflin on him. Uh, I remember a day down in Turles against Galway. Um, geez, that a new lad wing back that's it's escaped me now but he just put him on at four points from play in the first five, ten, seven or eight minutes your man was destroyed and they were at this the whole time um, they put him on uh, they did that in Ireland final as well against Tip it was a John O'Keefe was wing back and they put Henry over left half forward T Tommy hit the first two or three balls across over the bar and then they, they switch him and whether he switched himself like, but they, they dictated the whole game plan around on ahead Anthony yeah, no, just, I, I, he, I was kind of near the end of my days as he was coming on. I actually, one of his first appearances in a, in a, in a challenge match uh, down in Johnstown, I think we went down to play him opening of dressing rooms as you did on a Sunday night that time. And this kind of young, fresh-faced, ginger-haired lad came on me. No clue who he was, to be honest. And uh, 
first puck out, put up the hand and caught it. I remember coming home in the car with Sean McMahon and James O'Connor. Sean, he was driving, saying, who's that young fella that came on in me, lads? He was bowling anyway. He says he put up his end. And of course, it was, it was, that's, young, that's Henry Scheffler now, says James. He, Jesus, I says to tell you. But as I watched it, and you know, the great appreciation I got from it was afterwards, really, when I was, when I was the clear coach and the Dublin coach. I had coached against him so often. And, uh, you know, while the odd day we managed to hold him, I, I, what, I, what I thought about him was his reading of the game his spatial awareness, like, you know, the play would be going on at one side of the field and he might be, let's say, left half forward at this stage. As, as Michael said, he could be anywhere, really. You know, you, you, you wouldn't be surprised, top of the left, top of the right, centre wing, wherever, full. Um, but he, he would drift over near me on the Hogan stand sideline and, no, and the wing back would have lost his train of thought, like, you know, and sucked into the play and Shefflin would have opened up the whole thing and, of course, they were all aware that he was brilliant at it. And you're screaming as the manager of the opposition, trying to say, get over, get over, but no one can hear you because it's a Leinster final or, or an Ireland semi-final or something. And he just had that brilliant spatial awareness as well as having the hands, you know, the vision. And he could mix it physically, Dalo. Like, oh, Jesus. You know? Yeah, 100. Yeah. Yeah, she was a big, powerful man as well. Yeah. Um, Michael, um, just going back to his, the kind of yeah, his, yeah, yeah, his predecessor as a... Uh, you know, kind of, as we say, is the icon of Kilkenny Hurling was DJ. And it's a very good point that, you know, he played on an inferior team. But you were a contemporary. Could you kind of give people who maybe weren't around at the time an idea of how big a star DJ Carey was and kind of what the expectation levels were around him when he was on a, as we say, maybe below Kilkenny standard team? Yeah, it's interesting, uh, my guy. As, as I got to mark both of them young and when DJ we played him in a colleges final with Flannan and uh, he was the opposite corner forward to me but he was only 15 and we were all 18 and a half maybe or 18 <laughs> you know uh, so he didn't get much that day but two years on when he was 18 uh, the 89 All-Ireland Colleges final I think he scored 3-5 against Flannan <laughs> from full forward and you just said wow do you know this guy and uh yeah, from there, like, I mean, Jeannie Mack, we, we would have came across them. And, you know, I remember the, one of the most unbelievable days, and this is why I'd be kind of going for full forward, was I think it was 97, they played Galway. It was the first year the back door, Michael, uh, and they'd been beaten in, in, in Leinster uh, by Wexford. And they played Galway in a quarter final. And remember, Galway had dominated the first half along Turles. And Jesus, he turned on a display in the second half. It was just incredible. And we were meeting the winners. And I remember uh, meeting Joe Connolly in the car park, uh, just stuck him on one of those fields, had gone down to watch it, and he just said, what about Kerry? Like, and, of course, he eventually wound up coming out on me and getting an unreal goal in that semi-final. Uh, well, I wouldn't be able to catch him anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, like, look, for us, it suited maybe if he was inside and Brian Lowe, and who was probably our best defender. But they, like Henry, they used to target maybe if they saw oh, he'd, have, he'd have the attributes to beat a certain player. <laughs> They'd lobby him on to him, and uh, I was pretty, some of the stuff he did to Wexford. Remember the early nineties? He absolutely tortured them. Like, you know. yes, that's that's true. We'll, we'll skip over yeah. that. Uh, yeah. Michael, you were like you were on a you were on an awfully team that was very much a team. Like you were, you know, like people list off the entire fifteen. It's kind of just your strength was in your number, but in a way, like DJ was at times an army of one on that Kilkenny team. Certainly in the forward line, would you say? Yeah, well, there was Charlie Carter and, you know, uh, John Power and uh, oh, later on, Brian McAvoy. Like, there was a lot of good players. Like, you don't get a Kilkenny jersey too easy. Um, but the, what he did was he created absolute terror in a, in a defence. Now, we had only one, only that we had Brian Whelan. Like, that was our thing. Put Brian Whelan on him. And, but then, obviously, Kilkenny were trying to get him off him and creating mismatches. One time, they put him in full forward against us and, obviously, Whelan couldn't go full back. It'd be at that type of thing. But, Whelan tended to nearly ignore his own man and try to keep an eye on Kerry as well, you know, and, and he often got in a hook or a block to, to save us. But, but he was just, to me, there's a couple of things. He's the only player I think I ever saw um, before or since that could get a ball 50 yards out and three seconds later or five seconds later in the back of the net. He could just, he could pick a ball out of the ground, turn his man and head straight for the goals. He was completely fearless. Uh, his vision was unbelievable. His his ability to pass off either hand from his handball hand days, pass, the hand pass thing, the hand was pass was no. incredible. Um, his power and strength, the strength of his arms and strength of his wrist, and his shot was ferocious. And then he was the most unbelievable sportsman. He was never booked in his entire career, which is is one of the statistics that's that's unbelievable. Because 
any of us to play the game. You can there can be a mistimed tackle, or there can be whatever it is, or there can be a deliberate one, or, or whatever the crack. But he was never so. He had absolutely everything, and um, and he was just he was he just lit up like some of the stories in Kilkenny about county finals, and uh, you know he was uh, Goran, and there were you know six and seven and eight points down coming into the last and scoring two goals or three goals, and that day in goal against goal at two seven, I think in the second half that day, all these type of legendary sort of Cool Cullen type stories and. And um, no, he was, he was, he was a genius. And um, I'd say there's very little between him and and Shefflin and TJ you now, as I said, coming along. Mm-hmm. And we're only talking, we've, we haven't talked but about he, Joe Cannon or anyone else yet. He much has said, he much has said, Michael, about Sid had a good handle on him, and with the whole country knew that, and they look forward to those battles. But what I don't know what year it was. It was he got away from Sid one of the days. I think in Leinster final or semi final, I was televised and. I remember just Sid baiting the ground with his hurley, like in frustration. <laughs> he had done so well in him, I think, for maybe sixty-two or three minutes, and Kerry got one break and buried. But what, but what he actually did there, Anthony, if in that particular instance, Whelan had him tracked because he had the pace to stay with him. He was the only player probably in Ireland at the time that could stay with him for pace. And Kerry knew he was on his tail. He threw up ball, hit it, and Whelan came in to hook him, and he took it back on his hurl and changed direction, just swiveled a half a yard the other way. Whelan was gone and he stuck it in the net off the hurl. It was just unbelievable awareness of where he was at full flow to leave one of the greatest defenders of all time to out, out start him, which didn't happen to Ryan Whelan very often. It, it, it was just Whelan went for the hook and he knew it was coming and he, he second-guessed him. Outrageous stuff. Yeah. Um, just moving on to someone, we'll come back to TJ in a minute. I just want to overdo the, to overdo the Kilkenny. I just want to mention Nicky English for a second and um, Rory. Um, the one thing I always saw with Nicky English, I've been quite young watching him, I was always kind of scared for Nicky English because he never wore a helmet. He sometimes wore a gum shield. He was doing outlandish things with the ball in a time when defenders kind of didn't ask too many questions. I always got the impression Nicky English was like like five seconds from a career-ending injury, but I always seemed to evade it. He was as tough as nails, but he didn't look it because he was kind of this skillful player who uh, scored all the points off either side and he was just beautiful to watch. But like he played in an age where you had to be like made of granite pretty much but he didn't look like he's made of granite and quite dangerous as well like you know the the wood used to fly around a lot more there would be a lot more flahu luck with the wood back then and nicky i was there in um 1991 the famous one i think where he kicked the ball was that the one in was that the monster final i, I couldn't get in actually because i was selling programs that day in Parky Cueve and as soon as I'd finished selling the programs I tried to get into the ground and I think it finished in a draw and the match went back up to Turles uh, and, and, Tip, and Tipperary won and I think Nicky had a blinder I don't know whether he scored 2-4, two, 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 5 or something the same day but Nicky was an artist I think as well and just played the game like even people I suppose that wouldn't necessarily be too fond of Tipperary Loved Nicky English, and that's probably the best thing you could say about him, really. You know, <laughs> <laughs> no one got to, there's no one going to agree or disagree. Uh, um, I, I, I'm not sure for a second, but I, I suppose in 1989, um, I was working in the bank in Dublin, and Nicky left teaching to come to the bank. He'd won five Fitzgibbons with UCC famously. Um, he, he went doing teaching, I think, to take the soft. Nicky would be very sprightly, he's an investment manager now. But uh, he, he did, went teaching, uh, stayed an extra year in UCC for the Hurling and uh, was teaching down in Limerick uh, in Abbey CBS and then came, joined the bank. And Nicky was, to, to go back, uh, Mikey, you asked the question earlier about, explain, DJ was a superstar, but Nicky had this aura, this charisma, and Tip, and Tip had been so long waiting for this sort of messiah and this to win in All-Ireland. He, he was sort of godlike down in Tipperary and he had but he had a, a and Anthony would know Nicky well and I know they had a few run-ins on the field we can come around to that in a minute but uh, mm. but Nick, I got to know Nicky very well and um, you know he's, he has that very engaging personality he's a great man with names he remembers everybody he just has a, he's, he's a very sound he's fella a very warm and character isn't he very, wa- very, yeah. very nice guy and I but, but I saw him then I played bank, the bank hurling at the time believe it or not was a fairly big thing I remember Playing inter firms and playing inter bank competitions, uh, maybe the Friday before a big club game, or maybe the Monday after a county match. You know, it was and there was no such thing as you're not playing like you played. And Nicky played, but I saw him up close then, and, and the t- type of things you're talking about, Mikey. 
like the speed, the vision. And that's what killed him really, pulling hamstrings and pulling calves later on. But his vision, his speed, his style, his bravery, um, you know, he took some awful belts. Jeez, I remember some awful of Awful belts. He got an awful belt against Cork one day, and I don't remember who it was. I think it, it, maybe someone pulled the wrong way, but he got it straight into the mouth. He lost loads of teeth and stitched up inside now. But it never, and it, the scars he has on, but he kind of wears them as a badge of honour. You know, I don't think he'll, there's him and Sheedy maybe, and one or two more that have that Tipperary thing, and don't be fooled by it. Like, they don't care about anybody else. They don't care about any other county, anybody else. They're ruthless uh, when it comes to Tipperary and winning. And he has that in behind that. Liam probably doesn't cover it up as well when he's on the sideline, but Nicky was the same and he went on to manage tip as well. So he has to be in any discussion about, about great players and great teams, but, but you know, he's probably a different, completely different type of player than the players we were talking about there. How, how many of those scars did you give him, Dela? I, I never got close enough, Mikey. Uh, he, yeah, look, I, I originally would have played cornerback for Clare for the first few years I was on it and, and I would have came across that lethal full forward line of English, Bonner and Fox. And invariably, I was right corner back, so Fox, I would be on Fox, and he cleaned me off and enough. But I remember one day distinctly, we, we were kind of doing okay on them uh, down in Turles in a Division One league game, and I was marking Fox, and one of the days maybe I was kind of breaking even with Fox, but whoever was the other corner back, he remained nameless now anyway, he was making his debut, and uh, he was in big trouble on Nicky. I'll never forget Lengana running down the sideline and said, Dalo, over the other corner, and I just said, you leave me alone. Like, <laughs> I was fine, like, and Fox was like, Fox gave me many of skinning, but I was doing okay the same day, and she was over in your man after getting about one three and talk about, you know, like he just, he's speed at heart, he's first touch. For me, he was the kind of, this is the real stylist. He, he would draw in a crowd to see a game. That was the way I, I looked at him. He was that type of guy that could do anything next. He might try and flick it over your head, uh, you know, hit it on the run then off the hurley even the famous kick goal against your Cunningham he's just he, he was the guy that you didn't know what he'd do next and, and, and for me that's what made him an absolute star and as and Michael said then like uh, ruthless alright but then uh, like had Manny's a word on the field with him now we were trying to break on remember 94, 95 and he was coming right near the end himself and Foxy and especially remember the league game in Ennis where there was fair awards flying about, hang him up, you're finished. Like, you know, and didn't go down well. And thank God we didn't meet him later on. Thank God we met Limerick, I think. Um, both. Um, yeah, just for me, he would be on any uh, of the greatest team of all time. I, I, I had that much admiration for him. And like Michael would have known him a lot longer, but has become a great old friend later on in years then as well. He's a great guy and his face, like that's the first thing you do notice is his despair. Oh my but, God. But, and, and just to say on Nicky as well, I don't, listeners might know this, but uh, Nicky comes from a place called Cullen in Tipperary and it, it's right on the Limerick border and it's near Ula, uh, 00 LA as they call it down there. And Nicky never played hurling until he went to secondary school. And, uh, you know, he, it's a very much a football area that had a bit of a junior hurling team. He played with him his entire career. He never left him. Latin Cullen is the club. Um, but his loyalty to where he came from and his loyalty to... But the way... like He, he had no big background in hurling or anything like that. And then to pick it up and within a few years, you know, just become a, a sort of a... G By the time he was 16 or 17, like he was being talked about all over over the country. Um, so it just shows you... Um, and, uh, you know, so, some crack down there. I was down uh, at, his, at his dad's funeral and, uh, last year, uh, God rest him, and Nicky was saying a few words and... Uh, it was it was priceless to slag him with the with the Limerick crowd, the, like to, to show the, the, the GA is about. I can't use some of the, the language now that was used. Uh, Nicky covered it up well, but but what makes the GA the rivalry and the friendships after, like Dan said? Yeah, um, m- moving back forward in a little bit because we like the thing with the half forward is, as you say, there's just so many absolutely ridiculous talents here to talk about. But we do we do have to talk about Joe Canning, um, mm. who thankfully no longer has the tag of greatest hurler to never win in all Ireland because it would have been a crying shame if that one had stayed with him. Because I don't think anybody could disagree his talents deserved in all Ireland. But just a couple of th- one thing about him I always like thinking about is the um, everyone that the behind the behind the back hand pass to uh, David Burke against Cork back in I think it was in 2011. Like, it's an insane piece of skill. Everybody loves looking at it. When you look at that clip, that starts, the ball comes back in his direction because he's the man who's hassling John Gardner and he's the man who's putting pressure on the court wing back to play a rush pass, which ends up coming straight back at Canning. He is, it, no one would forgive him for just dictating, standing on 
standing on the 40, 65, demanding the ball, and that's all he did all game. But he does so much more than that, Michael, doesn't he? He is an absolute Trojan workhorse when really he has no business being a Trojan workhorse. Well, Joe Canning is a, Joe Canning is just a brilliant hurler. You know, he's again he came, he came on the scene at um, sixteen or seventeen down in Pertumna within the championship and kind of has that on his shoulders, that weight of expectation every single day he goes out since then until now. And he's still the most important player by far on the Galway team. Um, and he suffers, I think, a little bit like it's something maybe we've got very much into social media and into into an, uh, analyzing like we, we would look back on the DJs and the Brian Whelans and them just and just say they're great players. We don't get into every puck of the ball and everything they did right or wrong. But I think the likes of Tony Kelly and Joe Canning and Patrick Horgan, the modern great players are analyzed so closely and people are looking for a weakness. Whereas if they're not 10 out of 10, that, you know, well, he didn't do this and he didn't do that and he didn't win this and he didn't win that. How much can a man do on the field? Or he didn't do that in the second half or he went hiding against Kilkenny when he was in full forward and all this, all these debates that don't happen around like say, myself when I was playing, if you got a few pucks at the ball, you had a great game. You know, they're judged, <laughs> well, they're, they're judged at a completely different level. If you know yeah. the point I'm making, it yeah. has to be 14 points or one twelve or everything. Mm. Or, like going out and doing. If 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 Tony Kelly or Joe Canning or Patrick Horgan did some of the things and they were just an or, judged as a normal team player, to be classified as geniuses if they did them once, never mind every single day. So that's just a that's a little. Little thing I have on my uh, on my show. In, in some in some in some ways, Michael and Anthony and even Mikey, like they, in some ways, I often wonder with him is because um, the the very first memory I have of him in in a senior in in a senior capacity is the two thousand and eight. I think it might have been a qualifier or possibly a preliminary quarter final against Cork below in Thurles. Um, it was the, it was the, that Cork team were kind of coming to the end. Don Log was sent off the same day for pulling Canning down. I think uh, we sent off by um, Barry Kelly, and I think Joe scored two eleven, if I'm not mistaken. Certainly in and around that, and it was kind of his announcement onto the team. When you think about it, now that's twelve years ago. So he probably was only about eighteen, maybe nineteen years of age. And um, did he create a little bit of a rod for his home back with that? And that like people just assumed that every time he was going to go out. He was going to score, you know, two eleven, two twelve, and you know, it was just unrealistic for no matter what player, like you know, as good and all as that he was. So, yeah, I think it's it's a time, isn't it? yeah, and I, I think it's a bit like the TJ Reid thing at the at the minute where we're saying he wasn't involved as as good as many good teams as Henry. So it's and even if you look at the last couple of years, there's been days where TJ has gotten man of the match and scored very little from play. So, you know, I think like it's you have to look at the overall like he yeah, I remember that was Gerald Ocan's second year in charge of Galway, I think. Uh, that's correct, he, yeah. He, he pulled out after that and they lost the game actually. Yeah, they uh, lost it was kind of the last thing of a dying wasp from that particular Cork team. Yeah, and, and uh, I remember I was on duty that day, I was on live um and yeah, he was unbelievable. And even go on, he was I, I he must have been only nineteen or because the following year in and under 21, All Ireland semi final with Clare and, and themselves, 09. Himself and Dara Conan had the most amazing shootout down in Turles. It was incredible stuff. Like, it was, you know, uh, Dara probably had nothing like his senior career afterwards, but um, they, they just absolutely, it's whichever one of them was going to score the most, the most. So, yeah, and he, like, he would have suffered a bit with Galway un, underachieving, I think, at times. Michael is dead right. Like, he had to nearly get to 212 or. Uh, Joe wasn't there, but you just remember even the club stuff with Portumna. I remember one one of the days they played Kilkenny when they came into Leinster, um, and we spoke about JJ being a complete anomaly, not being on this team. And you know the goal he got off JJ early on in that match for the crossfield ball delivered into full and caught it, spun JJ, skinned him and buried it in the far corner like Jesus Joe. Sure, I mean, did we ever have a player up to Joe that like nearly every sideline? And every penalty or twenty-one, you expected a goal or a point. The point, you're like the point in the twenty seventeen semi-final against Tipperary. Who would actually take that shot on? Who in else that would take that on? In that yeah, situation, you know? in the first five minutes of the game, grand, but pretty much, you know, the dying seconds, you needed to win the game. Yeah, like he had, he had less, he had microseconds, milliseconds to think about that, Michael, and he like absolutely bisected the post. It was an incredible score. It was, and 
I suppose, look, he did mature as well himself, you know, over the years. Um, like he, I think he had to learn fast. Galway Club Hurling, as you, we <laughs> all know, it, it's a tough, uh, it, it's very tough physically. It's very intimidating atmosphere. Um, I would, you know, know to have seen well down there. So would Anthony, from, even from challenge matches. They're bad enough, never mind championship matches. But Abandoned. <laughs> yeah, and it, 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 yeah. So we had a game with Atten Ryan one day that was abandoned after about twenty minutes after coming we coming down from Rhinus uh, down to Atten Ryan a bus on Saturday evening. It only really lasted about twenty minutes. It all hell broke loose. But um, the good old days. But uh, anyway, um, like Joe, Joe from the, from the very start, and and they loved antagonising him. So he had to handle that physical intimidation, mental intimidation. And then he, he's obviously a big man, very powerful, very strong, very brave, like all these great forwards. Like they all have that in common. Um, but, you know, just some of the scores and some of the individual things. Like, like he can do things that Shefflin couldn't do. And yeah. D, DJ can do things that Joe couldn't do. You know, that's what makes them. And TJ can do, like TJ is probably maybe somewhere in the middle of them all. But he, just briefly on TJ, he spent three or four years trying to break onto the Kenny team because yeah. Cody was testing them and all that. He so was kind of play, packing it up at one stage as well, Michael, wasn't he? Like, well, and, he was, and he was no hmm. spring chicken at this stage. I think there was a well, rumour flying around, I think maybe 9 10, that TJ was saying, like, I'm not going to make it here and I'm going to turn me back on the sport. Like, it's, or, not, it's not a rumour. Yeah, it's not a rumour that uh, Henry had to talk to him at, at, at one stage. Um, he he he, had, he came on and scored four points in one of them All Irelands. It was at the Waterford one. And um, but but look, it, it, the the point I'm making is that it, this just doesn't happen. You don't become one of these type of players that we're discussing here now. And we've had we've had discussions over all the lines so far. But I think when you look at the players in that half hour, the players we're not even talking about here. Jamesy, no, who you played with, Mike, Michael Cleary, who won four All Stars in a row no. from tape. Johnny Dooley, who was one of the best hurlers I ever saw. Uh, I'm only talking about personally for Offley. Uh, Noel McGrath, the vision he has. You can go Bonner Maher, the work he did for him. Like, there, there's an abundance because that line, I think it was Henry said it when he was on with you, the, the, the half, the maybe centre back, centre forward, he talked about. But I think that battle between the half back and half forward, and Delo will know this, that is where games are won and lost for you. You know, if, if you get on top and the half, if the half back line gets on top, you saw it for Tip for years, the struggle to win possession. That was their big activist. You saw Park or yourself over the years mm. struggle to get the ball. That Kilkenny half back line just swamped everybody and they forced the people to put the ball along. So if you hadn't a half hour line to break that down, you're going over because you can't get the possession to win the game. And, uh, and that's why we're talking about like Martin's story, Gary Kirby. Gary Kirby won four All Stars. He never, never won All Ireland. You know, there's, there's only Martin Quigley from Wexford, probably before that time. But all these great players. Um, Dan Shanahan. Ken McGrath. Yeah. Ken McGrath, Brick yeah. Walsh. Yeah. yeah. To break all think, these out. Do you think there's anything, just, you've both kind of mentioned it, I throw Tony Kelly into the mix now, that we kind of talk about, like in America, they talk about, you know, franchise players, like Jordan and the last stand. It, is the media partly to, to, blame, to blame or do they contribute to the fact that we contribute to the fact that players now, you, you talk about Joe Canning, he can't, if he was mere mortal, he'd be praised from the rooftops, but people expect it. Like TJ Reid, Joe Canning, Henry Shefflin, his day, Tony Kelly now. You could say Lee Chin with Wexford. There's almost every team has this one player who's almost like a marquee player. They're expected to do things that others aren't expected to do. And they're put on pedestals because they have, maybe it's because they have endorsement deals and they do a lot more media than other players. But also because they have this talent. But like, there was players that like, DJ Carey or going back further, there's players that talented, but they were part of a team. Whereas now, is there some kind of expectation that each, that there are certain players, one per county, who should in some way transcend normal expectations? Yeah, but I think that's looked for, Mikey, as well. Like, and it'd be one of the things, I suppose, that maybe with Dublin, I would have said that, you know, we had a good forward line and young Sutcliffe to me at the time looked like he would become, you know, real. Maybe we'd be even talking about him today. But somehow they just never discovered that that kind of real genius. Like well, they maybe, did, they did, but he went. But he went playing football, football. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, yeah. And, I, and having and having suffered yeah. at his hands at club level, Rory. I, yeah. you know, oh, like, listen, how, genius. And, and, like, you know, you, I mean, you, like, you're, you're, yeah. you're nine out of ten. Yeah, and like, and and maybe you know. But then, yeah, you go back to your point, Mike, and I think, yeah, I I would hear it the whole time up here. You know, you go for a beer after a league game and. Uh, Tony, Tony Kelly has maybe not had the greatest day. It's nearly the first thing drawn down. Mm. Do you know, you know, Kelly, where was Kelly today? Like, you know, Jenny, he got a good point in the first half. But and like, as, as, it's a bit like the Joe Canning thing. Like, he just expected to carry the can. Like, but 
Jesus, he watched the Clare Championship over the last few years. And you see, of course, people in other counties don't see it, but some of the stuff Tony has done for Bellier, like it's just yeah, 13 it's points and this sort of stuff from midfield, like, and uh, that's an incredible player. You see, same with Hoggy, like, if Hoggy is held, let's say, by Nolly Connors in, in certain games, I couldn't do it against Nolly Connors that day when they needed him. But oh, Jesus, overall, you have to look at the overall package mm. with these guys. And, and you look at the likes of Kelly, hopefully still has time to embellish the 213 year. You know, even 2016 when Clare won the league, like, I mean, Kelly nearly won the league for them that, that year. And, and for me, like, they still have a chance. Uh, Austin Gleeson would be another one that'll fall in now to that sort of bracket, have him won uh, mm. hurler of the year and that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's, it's very difficult on those lads. You yeah. know? Uh, but you still Kelly, love to have him, Michael. I, I, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I, I just think, I think on t- like Tony Kelly was having a great league as well um, this year, I think, this under year. Brian, absolutely flying it. And I think a little bit, he's, he's, he's I, I don't know what age he is now, uh, Dale, is he about 26 or 7? 27, I'd yeah. say, Michael, sometime yeah. this year, yeah. Like, he still has, I think that maturity I talked about in Joe, I think one of his, if you're looking for a weakness, is that maybe he takes on too much himself, you know, that it's, He'll score six from player, but he could hit six wides. You know, it's just that decision making maybe at times that maybe comes because I think I have to do everything, but now realize I have other players around me. I think Joe has really, Joe Canning has really grown into that team player over the last three or four years. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, lads, I think we almost uh, we'll leave it at that now. I think we've, uh, we, we, we've boosted a few egos here today. The half forward line was always going to be a little bit that way. Um, no room for JJ Delaney, unfortunately. I don't, I don't think. Did JJ ever score a point? He probably did. I'd say, Mike, if you checked it out. Yeah, but I, I, don't, I don't, certainly don't remember one. But no, yeah. Yeah. Most, great, most great left half backs popped up with a boomer of a one every so often. Like, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, well, look, lads, um, thanks very much. And just to remind everybody, there's still time to vote here for the half forward line. You'll find the. Uh, You'll find the article on the hurling section of the RT website in the News Now app. So we'll we'll announce the uh, the winner on next week's podcast probably, and uh, I'm sure the three winners, and we'll have some nice consternation there. Just like to say thank you to Michael, Anthony, and Rory for joining me. And um, the Sunday game, Rory, quickly the Sunday game. Back on Sunday game. night, half past nine. I think uh, Dalo's on board as well, um, and uh, for this Sunday, and it'll be back this Sunday and every Sunday anyway. Certainly for the foreseeable short term future, and sure we will see how things pan out. Um, half nine this Sunday coming, a mix of archive, more recent archive, um, a little bit of uh, some features, some interviews, some, um, some Zoom calls, some spe- special guests, and Zoom <laughs> calls, and little colour packages and yeah it'll be a bit of fun and something to look forward to a little bright spot like in the yeah. current times we live in and we have uh, we have plenty of GA on the RTE website and we <clears> will have Sunday Sports back again at 2pm 2, 2 this weekend so that's the GA on the RTE platform so again just thank you to Michael, Anthony and Rory and we will chat to you again next week cheers guys Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road. And that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurling, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Wow. And-